Thank you, Kim, Rick. Preaching again from Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It'll be just a starting point for us, but it's very important past the scripture to put some things into perspective. I want to congratulate you for the progress that you've made in reading through the Bible. And I know this is week one, and it's just one week of the whole year. However, this may be one of the more difficult weeks, and simply because it didn't take long that you uh, had to face the begats. Uh, and the begats are hard to deal with, and that's genealogies. And it's very tedious, of course, with all the names and all the generations, and they're not names like we're accustomed to pronouncing. And so you've gotten through all that, but I know maybe the question is, why is this all important? Because a lot of times we'll glaze through that, and though at first glance it's hard to see the significance of the genealogies, but their contents are significant in regards to the whole Bible message to the whole framework of the message, this passage of Scripture is tied into that. Particularly, the major theme of God's eternal plan to provide salvation to lost and fallen humanity and his specific commission to his church to proclaim the good news of that salvation. And you'll see where the genealogies tie in heavily to the book of Acts, but we're going to start here, and then we'll go to other places in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Would you stand as the scriptures read, please? Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered and Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Philip was found at Azotus. Passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the whole story of your word. We thank you that every part's important, even the parts that may be more difficult to read and hard to to go through and understand the significance, but Father, help us to see These parts are important, too. Thank you for the main message of the whole Bible, Jesus Christ and him crucified for sinners. And, Father, we ask that we would see that major framework through every passage that we read. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned, the genealogies are important. They're They're important specifically as you look at the major framework of the Bible and, of course, the commission to the church to promote the good news of the salvation that, have, that is promoted in the Scripture. Now, I want us to look at the commission, which is important, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Many of you know it by heart, but we read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. You know it as the Great Commission. Listen to what Jesus says. Last instructions he gave to his church, gave this to his disciples. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, 
I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. We think of nations, we think of geographical and political boundary lines, but the word used here is ethnos. Go and make disciples of all ethnos. Now, the word ethnos is the word which we get ethnic, and of course, it means people groups. Specifically, scholars say it could be narrowed down to races. Go make disciples of every race. That particular time, racial heritage was important to the Jewish people. And all people, their racial heritage, the people group they belonged to was very significant and very important. So therefore, they would more likely identify as a particular people group or a particular race of their lineage than they would a political boundary. So we understand that he was trying to speak in a language that they would understand of who is it that we are to reach? Who can we preach to? Or maybe who can we not preach to? And Jesus said, we're commissioned to go to every racial group, every ethnic group, every people group. That's important. Now, who are these people groups? There's where the genealogies are important. Genesis chapter 10. The origin of the people group. You know the word Genesis means beginnings. We only see, of course, we see about the beginning of the earth, but we also see the, the beginning of the framework of society as we know it. And part of this framework is, of course, the different races and people group, ethnic groups in the world. Now, this should be familiar to you if you read your Bible, uh, even if you didn't get a check. If you read this, you're fine. Now, I'm, I'm just wondering this about, let's, let's get through this check business right now. I can't fix all this, but I'm just wondering if some of you had some issues in grade school getting your star moved or something, but you want to be sure that your star's in the right column. I assure you, God knows you read it, okay? We're all, that's what we're worried about. But look in Genesis chapter 10. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood, all right? Three sons, three major genealogies here. Let's look first of all, Japheth. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Teres. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Ribath, and Togrima. The sons of Japhon were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodonim. From these, the coastland peoples... Of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Now, Japheth. Japheth was the forefather of the Gentile people group. Who were the Gentiles? Well, we know them as the non Jewish, light skinned people. In the world, that would be the Europeans and the Asians. That'd be us. So when we talk about the racial makeup of the white people in the world, and I know they separate the, the Asians as a racial group, but when you look at the major three groups, you have the light-skinned, non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And the Jewish people pretty well separated the population of the earth into Jewish and non-Jewish, but we have three main groups that are here. So Japheth, of course, would be the forefather of one people group, and that's the Gentiles. And so when you read through the New Testament, you read about the Gentiles. You read through the Old Testament, you read about Gentiles. That's our group. That's our group right there. That's, that's who we are as the, the white people in the world. Now, verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Miserim, Hut, and Canaan. Now, we'll stop right there because we'll zero in on Cush. Cush had a land that bore his name. That land that bore his name is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. However, other historians, other scholars in non-biblical writings identify the land of Cush as being Ethiopia. The ancient land of the Ethiopians was Cush, and the inhabitants of that land was known as the Cushites. Ethiopia 
as we look in the scripture from the book of Acts, this man, this eunuch, this person of great authority, he was the financial manager for the queen of the Ethiopians. That area was down south in Egypt through Sudan and present-day Ethiopia. So we understand that is the area of the world. So we have Ham, specifically Cush, that led the nation of Ethiopia, specifically the black race. You remember in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, he says, can an Ethiopian change his skin color? Can a leopard change its spots? He was talking about, of course, the black race. Now, put an asterisk and a star beside this. The first fully non-Jewish convert to Christianity that's specifically mentioned in the Bible was a descendant from Ham, a black man. Now, you might say, well, what, what about the Samaritans? Oh, they were half-Jewish people. They were not fully non-Jewish people. But the Bible celebrates the first convert, and we know there may have been more earlier, but the first one that's mentioned in a specific way was this man from Ethiopia. And it's the first man outside of the Hebrew family that accepts Jesus Christ was a black man. Isn't that something? And then there's Shem. If you look in verse 21, and the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. Now skip over to 11, verse 10. Genesis 11, verse 10. This is the genealogy of Shem. This is important. Trace this one all the way through. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad, two years after the flood. After he begot Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years, begot sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 35 years and begot Selah. After he begot Selah, Arphaxad lived 103, 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Selah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. After he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Rehu. <coughs> After he begot Rehu, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Rehu lived 32 years and begot Sherug. And after he begot Sherug, Rehu lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Sherug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. After he begot Nahor, Sherug lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram. So we understand Shem was the father of the Hebrew race, Jewish people. So we have the three major people groups in the world from which all other people groups sprung. We have the descendants of Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Japheth, Europeans, Asians, white people. We have Ham, Cush, black people. Then we have the Jewish race. Those are the major groups. Those are the groups from all other people groups spun. Now, when you look at this, you have to look at the unrestrained power of the gospel. The reason we say the unrestrained power of the gospel, it was beyond human power to do what the gospel did and because there were barriers between each of these people groups. There were massive barriers between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. We'll look at that in a minute, Gentiles. We even know about the major barrier between white people and black people today, and it seems to be insurmountable in just about every culture on our planet but here's the unrestrained power of the gospel to reach every people group. In Acts chapter 8, where we read this Ethiopian eunuch, except Christ, he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's baptized and goes his way rejoicing. No doubt he's a genuine child of God now. He's in the family of God. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we have another man. 
His name is Saul. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. The first converts to Christianity were the disciples. They were Jewish people. Oh, but Saul was different. They were Jewish people, full-blood Jewish people. But you remember, of course, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 5, Saul was, who became Paul, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee, as Jewish as you could get, with papers, credentials. He was Jewish to the bone. He was Jewish regardless. He was more Jewish than anybody on the planet, is what he was saying. In Acts chapter 9, this Jewish person, which would have a major barrier between him and the gospel of Jesus, he got saved. The gospel reached him. And then there's Acts chapter 10. Cornelius, unmistakably a Gentile. You remember the story when Peter was called to go to his house. And he got into his house in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. He looked around and said, guys, according to my tradition, I shouldn't even be in your house. According to Jewish tradition, it's unlawful for me to even be here with you. But he said, I'm here and I'm going to share with you the gospel of Christ. And Cornelius got saved. Wow. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the fact that the gospel reached the Ethiopian, the descendant of Ham. The gospel reached Saul, the descendant of Shem. The gospel reached Cornelius, descendant of Japheth, all people groups. The power of the gospel, not only in numbers, but in rapid succession, someone from every race in the world was reached with this message in the book of Acts. And the Ethiopian, the Jew of the Jews, and the unmistakably Gentile Cornelius all became part of one family not three different groups. One family, the family of God. That's the power of the gospel. Now, I'd mention Tower of Babel has something to do with this, and it does. Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 11. Because the question was, why, and this is a good question, why would God scatter the people on the earth and confuse their languages. You would think if they were all talking together and getting along, it'd be a lot better. Well, let's look at the Tower of Babel, and let's look at the end result of the gospel, and we'll see the power of the gospel. In Genesis chapter 11, Now when the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said, Come, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks. Let's bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. They all have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language. They may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there all over the whole face of the earth. They ceased building the city. Therefore, the name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. From there, the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. So he confused the language, and this is quite interesting. He didn't confuse the language where no individual could speak with each other. He didn't confuse the language where nobody could talk to another person. He confused the language of the people groups, and he scattered them all over the world. So therefore, the Cushites down to the south, the Europeans, of course, and the Asians, up around other parts of the world, and the Hebrews there in what we call the Holy Land. Scattered them all. He scattered them because of their intent. Their intent was to make themselves a name. The intent was that their name would be exalted, that their name would be the most important, and their name would be remembered. God scattered them. 
Now, in the book of Acts, we see God bringing these people groups together. And they're communicating as a family. What's the result of that? God is reversing what he did at the Tower of Babel. Oh, it shows us the difference in the gospel and the difference in man's intentions. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. We'll back up to verse 8 to get the whole sentence. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp, golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. You were slain, you have redeemed us to God by your blood, listen to this, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. You have redeemed us by your blood out of what? Every tongue, every language, every people group. Now all of them were around the throne, and they were worshiping God. It gets better. Chapter 7, verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hand, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. That's the difference between the Tower of Babel and the family of God. The Tower of Babel scattered them because they wanted to make their own name. God's family comes together to exalt the name above all name, and that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every tongue, nation, people, he brings them together. For these divisions are no longer important. We're all one in Jesus Christ. So wow, in this passage of Scripture, in the book of Acts, it does tie itself to the genealogy. The begats are important in a way, aren't they? So we realize as we look at that to the whole framework of the Bible. And the framework is this. God has an eternal plan to save souls. And God's eternal plan includes us to proclaim this plan and his love to all nations on the earth. Is there anything before we close? Not let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you so much for coming.